You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here's your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I'm Christy Landwehr. And I'm Sarah Honiger, and you are listening to the special monthly NRHA episode of Horses in the Morning on Horse Radio Network for this Thursday, August 8th. Good morning, horse world. It's the second Thursday of the month. That means it's time to slide in to the National Reigning Horse Association episode of Horses in the Morning. Today, in this reigning podcast episode, we will be getting a behind-the-scenes tour of the iconic Four Sixes Ranch and finding out more about their breeding program and stallions. Then we're going to take a visit with Toy on Ranch, who focuses not only with quality stallions, but also amazing mares. Sarah, I am so excited to have yet another fabulous reigning podcast with you. How are you doing? So good. It's just the heat of summer over here in Oklahoma City, and we are in the thick of raining. So, you know, it's a fun time of year. So speaking of being hot, you know, I'm in Colorado, and people don't think we get very warm out here, but we're 100 degrees, so we're pretty warm right now. And my son, my eldest, is a whitewater rafting guide this summer, and he started uh, at the end of May, but we decided to wait until August to actually raft with him so that hopefully he won't flip (laughs) us over. But we're going to go this weekend, so I'll let you know how that goes. Oh my gosh, are you worried about being bucked off the raft, or how how do you think you'll do? (laughs) You know, the sun is an adrenaline junkie, so (laughs) it might be a little frightening, actually. But I guess we wear helmets, so there you go. I just, the option of getting flung off into the water, I don't know. The first thing I would think about, I don't know that it'd be a helmet. I know it's important, but (laughs) I would have so many concerns. Well, and crazy enough, there are so many rocks in the rapids that that's why. And then they teach you to like turn your body around. So you're going down the river feet first. Well, if I'm underwater spinning around, I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to go feet first. So anyways, it's all good <laughs> <an> adventure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it's going to mean so much to him to share what he's been doing all summer with his family and share that moment with you guys. So I can't wait to hear all about it. Yes, it'll be a fun weekend. We'll have to chat about it on the next show. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be good. So we have something really exciting coming up also this month on the raining side. Tell us a little bit more about the run for a million and how that all works. Yeah. So it's one of the most exciting events of the whole year, whether you are uh, an avid raining fan, whether you're brand new. Um, so it's the run for a million and it's held in Las Vegas and it started in 2019 And so this year, folks had to qualify, whether it was last year at the event or at a qualifying event in Arizona. So you'll see the best of the best compete for, uh, it's only one run, and there's $1 million added. So it's a huge deal, and you can watch live online as well. Um, So it'll be so fun. Neither of us will be there in person. We'll both be glued online as well. And I cannot wait to see how it all shakes out. It's going to be awesome. And a big thanks to Taylor Sheridan. It's, of course, his event, and um, Mm -hmm. they put it on. And it's just so great that he's, you know, willing to do so much for the reining industry that he loves so much as well. Absolutely. And there's a youth shootout, a rookie shootout. There's a non-pro piece of this as well. So uh, I think it's really neat to give love all across industry. We always talk about how We feel really unique that there's just so many places for so many different people to be a part of reigning. Uh, And I think he's done a beautiful job showcasing it with this event as well. And not to mention the South Point Arena and Hotel and Casino is all pretty fabulous. Oh, yeah. I mean, other (laughs) it's hilarious because you leave that event and it's been a week and you've never seen the outdoors. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. Or a window. (laughs) Or a window. Everything you need is right there. (laughs) It's so convenient. But you leave and you're like, huh, what an interesting concept, you know? (laughs) Well, we're so excited today to have our guests on who we'll introduce here in a little bit. But our whole show is going to be 
about breeding, um, breeding your own horse. If you have a mare that you want to, mm-hmm. how to pick the stallion, you know, what do you do exactly? All of those things. And of course, it's very dependent upon your breed and your discipline. But we're so excited today to have our guests on about that. So before we dive into that, though, Sarah, what have you done? Have you ever had anything exciting as far as a foal yourself? Or what is kind of your journey with the breeding world? So as you know, my family that, um, you know, I'm the very first one that was involved with horses at all. So I had, you know, my heart horse mare. I got her when I was 10 years old. I made state championships in rodeo. We made nationals together. She was just a luck, honestly, that we, she came into my life, but I begged and begged and begged to breed her. And rightfully so, my parents just kept saying, you know, none of us know what we're doing. <laughs> like maybe breeding a horse isn't what we should do in our one acre in the middle of suburbia. Um, so eventually I went to college rodeo for Oklahoma State and my rodeo coach's daughter bought that horse. We called her Skittles. And she won everything under the sun at every rodeo she entered. They would just beat the socks off the old people. I mean, they were incredible together. And eventually they pulled an embryo and had a little colt. And now I own that gelding. And it's so fun. You know, I never realized how much would really be passed down. Obviously, skill set, I knew that. But it's just kind of like having a clone of her again all over in my life. He's now eight and his mannerisms are the same. He acts just like her in every way. I mean, it's just been a dream come true and so much fun. And I've had the pleasure of meeting your horse, Johnny. He is pretty awesome. <laughs> and I love that, how traits and those things get passed on, you know, and it's pretty mm-hmm. amazing how that happens. And we actually have a sponsor of our Siren Dam program called Edelon, and mm-hmm. they actually are based in California. And you can just send them a little tiny bit of your horse's mane or tail, and they can tell you all kinds of things, not only as far as athletic ability, but whether they're spooky or not and what that all is about. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's pretty fabulous, all the different things we can do now with breeding and genetics testing. So what a really good story. It's just been so fun and it's so neat, you know, even if you're not looking to breed a horse right now, to your point, just the technology is so fun. I think it's just become a really fascinating part across all Western industry, well, equine industries as a whole, um, because it's kind of fun if you're a data junkie, if you're a science junkie, if you just kind of nerd out on watching horses go around in a show pen and seeing if they're like their parents or not. So all of that genetic stuff is really, I think, a fun way for people to plug in. Well, and right now it's so neat. You have a foal where you keep your horse, Johnny, and Mm -hmm. it's actually one of our fellow co-workers. She uh, bred her mare and had a beautiful little foal. Do you want Mm -hmm. to tell us more about Lauren's baby? (laughs) Yeah, Lauren will be so excited to hear this. Uh, Lauren has a mare that she lovingly calls Cookie. And so she hopes to have other babies and have them all be named different cookies in the jar, so to speak. So Ginger Snap was born Aww. a few months ago. Yeah. And uh, oh, my gosh, she's so cute. And Lauren runs our affiliate program at NRHA. And she's just so brilliant and passionate about the whole reining industry and has been a rainer her whole life. And so hopefully we'll all get to see Cookie and some show results one day. <laughs> I think that's awesome. And I want to, you know, I've always said it's a bucket list thing of mine. Maybe I'll have to redo it when I'm retired and have a lot of time on my hands. Hopefully I'll have time on my hands uh, (laughs) to be able to actually start a full. I've started a few three-year-olds in my career, but I've never actually worked with a full from the ground up. And I think it's all so very exciting and so wonderful of a process. I think that'd be so much fun. And maybe you'll even utilize NRHA Siren Dam program when you do it. That's a really good point. We are so excited to welcome our first guest, Dr. Nathan Cannaday. He is the horse division manager and veterinarian at the Four Sixes Ranch with 13 years of dedicated service to the ranch. He received his associate degree in science at Otero Junior College and pursued his doctor of veterinary medicine at Colorado State University, where he received several awards. Dr. Cannaday completed two undergraduate internships at the Four Sixes Ranch in 2006 in 2007 and was employed full-time in 2011. As the horse division manager, Dr. Canaday oversees all aspects of the horse breeding program, which includes coordinating breeding schedules, managing horse health, and their well-being. 
He also handles the veterinary needs of the cattle division at the ranch and offers services to their surrounding ranches as well. The Four Sixes Ranch is also the title sponsor of our NRHA Derby that we just had here in Oklahoma City in June. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. We are so happy to have you with us. And, you know, for us that are involved in the Western industry, we know the Four Sixes Ranch. It's so iconic. It's such a huge part of the history of the quarter horse and of the Western industry. But we also have some listeners that might not know. So would you mind providing some historical background on the Four Sixes? Sure, I'd, I'd be honored to. So the Four Sixes Ranch has been around since 1870. It was founded by Burke Burnett, um, and it's been in the Burnett family for over 150 years until Miss Ann, when she passed away in 2020, the ranch then went up for sale. Um, we had quite a few people come look at it, obviously, um, but thank the good Lord that Taylor Sheridan is the one who ended up buying it. Um, and, and I think he closed on the ranch in early 22. Uh, and so for the past two years, it's been under his ownership and, and we're continuing just as strong as ever, um, if not stronger, um, moving on and growing um, and, and very excited to be in the horse industry involved in multiple multiple facets, really. But but so so all that to say, the ranch has been around for a really really long time, and and it's been under men, you know the same family and same management for a long long time. So so it has a long history, and it's not just the recent history that we, that a lot of people see now with the movies and the association with the Yellowstone. Um, we've been a cattle ranch and a horse breeding operation for for many many years. So. And so I know we talked a little bit in your bio, Dr. Kennedy, about your typical, mm -hmm. your role there, but what does your typical daily routine look like, especially during breeding season? Oh, so it, you know, uh, it, it varies on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but, but pretty much a good summary is busy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dr. Britt Conklin, he's a good friend of mine. One time he came out and was visiting Adam consulting on a case and, and he goes, it's kind of like eating a bag of Skittles. You never know what kind of color you're going to get. And it's really true. So, so yes, we do a lot of equine reproduction, and that's kind of our our mainstay, our specialty. But we also do a lot of cattle work, and and yes, you know that entails a lot of preg checking in the fall. But also during the spring, they're also which is coincides with breeding season, they're calving out heifers and that sort of thing. So, so sometimes we have to do some dystocia work with the cattle division, help them out. Uh, also, you know, some people have in their mind that 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 as a ranch, we just do our own breeding and our own business, but really, truly, the majority of what we do is breeding for other people. Um, we're a full-on veterinary clinic and breeding facility. You know, we stand, um, you know, in the mid to upper 20s of stallions. Uh, we breed 1,800 mares a year, and, and so so on a given day-to-day, -day, you, you never know if you're going to be working just on horses, if you're going to be falling out a mare, if you're going to be working on a hospital case. We have three on-site veterinarians. And we stay busy with with general vet work, with reproductive work, and uh, and then really truly, for those of you who know where the four six is at, we're in the middle of nowhere, and and you know we go 90 miles to go buy groceries in town, and so it's a long way to the nearest veterinarian and a lot of big ranches, and and everybody has a ranch dog, a barn cat, a, a 4-H <laughs> show pig or sheep, you know, so it, the the wide variety that we work on keeps it very, very interesting. And that's one of the things I love because yeah. you never know if you're going to be working on a million dollar sire or, or brood mare, or if you're going to be working on a day worker's horse that the guy can't afford to do much. You have to get really creative from a veterinary mm -hmm. standpoint, you know, so it, I, honestly, I just love the variety. And, and whenever I wanted to become a veterinarian, one of my passions was I wanted to work on horses for people who work for a living. You know, whether it's it's whether it's people showing, whether it's cowboys and, and day workers, you know, but I wanted that bond between, you know, between a human and a horse is special anyway, but it's even more special between people who rely on their horse for their living. So true. That's beautiful. I just really, you know, it, you hear about how people get into a career, but to have that foresight and that feeling of like, these are the horses and the people I want to help. I think that's really a beautiful statement. 
And I was I was blessed to be able to do two undergrad internships, which makes me feel really old. But the first one was 18 years ago <laughs> and 17 years ago at this point. It feels like it was just the other day. But whenever I came down, you know, because I grew up in Colorado. And whenever I came down to the ranch, I just fell in love with the ranch. And I was just like, man, this would be my dream job if I could ever come back here, you know. And, and, uh, and so it was more honestly – the getting to know the ranch and and seeing the ranch and falling in love with the ranch that really truly for me solidified that this was the the route I wanted to take as a vet and as a career path. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Kennedy, I mean, I I love hearing about what brought you to this, and we know that there's a huge shortage right now of people entering the veterinary field, especially for larger mm-hmm. animals. Would you mind yes, sharing yeah. something that you've learned from being in this field that you think that maybe those younger people considering entering it might be able to really learn a lot from? Sure. Um, that's a good question because it, you're right. Whether you're talking veterinarians, horse trainers, breeders, you know, there's, there is such a, a need and demand for good, reliable help. So to me, I guess a couple, couple quick points is one is dream big. So I, I know I, I ha, I'm very, very blessed, and I know that. Two, I fell in love with the ranch, and I said to myself, this would be my dream job to get to come back here. And so I pestered Dr. Blodgett to death when I was in vet school until he hired me, and then and then I persisted and stayed on until, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so, so one thing is dream big. You know, don't be afraid to be like, you know, whether you're a horse trainer and you want to say, hey, someday I want to win the derby, or – you know, whether it's a breeder and someday I want to breed a horse that makes it to the derby or, or or I want to own this ranch or I want to do manage this or, you know, don't be afraid to dream big. But with that is you have to be persistent because the horse industry is not easy. You do have to work hard and you have to put in the hours. And one of, one of the trainers uh, I, I, that rides some of our horses, I, he brought a horse for me to look at the other day and, and uh, we, I was visiting with him and, and he goes, I don't, he's like, those of us in this horse industry, we're crazy, aren't we? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I guess we are. <laughs> but, uh, but so, so dream big, but also don't quit. You know, um, me and my wife always had a, a saying that we would tell each other or text each other, but it's be great. You know, and everything we do, you know, strive for excellence, be great. Mm-hmm. So that'd be the, the three things is dream big, don't quit and be great. I love all of that so much. And that I think is so good for everyone to hear, not just young people Mm -hmm. that are entering a career. So good. Mm -hmm. So I know the four six, of course, is there, like you said, in the middle of nowhere, Texas. But what sets (laughs) the four sixes ranch apart from other breeding facilities in our horse industry? Sure. So one of the the things that I mean, let's see if I can articulate it well, but but we have a long history and legacy at at doing things excellent, whether it's ranching, whether it's raising horses, breeding horses, doing veterinary work, you know, we've been successful for 150 years. And and so with that, there's that long history and legacy and and, and all that richness that comes from the past, but it's not enough to, to live in the past, obviously. So, so to me, what makes it great is we have all that history and legacy, but yet we couple that with change and excellence and, and things like that going forward to continually improve and strive. We, I mean, we always strive to be better. I, I don't know, a, a couple quick things to kind of, you know, to, to illustrate that. So something simple is like horse identification. So we still brand our horses. Um, and, and every horse has a number brand of the year they were born, who the mare is, who the sire is, and, and they have the L on their shoulder, which is what we're famous for, is that L on the shoulder. So you can just quickly look at that and see when, what year the horse was born and who the mom and dad are. But yet we still couple that with technology and doing things newer and better and innovative. And so since 2008, we've been microchipping the horses. And, and then we have it integrated now with the software program that, that has all the information about the horse, breeding plans all that stuff. And then also now we have an app too. So at any point I can pull up any information on any of our horses. And wow. and so we try to still maintain our roots and that history of ranching and Texas ranching and, and the 154 years ago when Burke Burnett started the ranch, you know, all of that sort of stuff. We still have those roots to that rich history, but yet we continually strive to continually improve. 
um, even even on pedigree and genetics. And and we're constantly trying to find new ways of, of how can we integrate, you know, this bloodline or, or what can we do different to be better. And, and that applies to our breeding, applies to our veterinary work, applies to our cattle division and, and um, our, our finances, our operation, you know, uh, hiring interns, veterinarians, everything we do, we just continually strive for excellence. So um, with that, though, you know, because you said what makes us separate from other breeding farms is it's not that we're not just in it to make money for ourselves. And, and like, you know, we stand um, for a large number of stallions for for other um, other people, other stallion owners. And, and I have lots of conversations and and I tell them all the time, like, my goal is to make you guys successful. You know, my goal is not to make mm-hmm. us successful, but because in making you guys successful, yes, we'll, we'll be just fine. You know, but if, if I can make you guys successful and your stallion successful, that's good for all of us, you know. And so, so you know, it's just that whole mindset of, of everything we want to do, we're doing it with excellence and high integrity. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe Leathers, the general manager of the ranch, Taylor Sheridan and myself, the three of us, like we operate at a high level of integrity and continually strive for excellence, which to me just permeates everything we do um, to to make us stand above the crowd, you know, because it has that trickle down effect in, in, you know, all the way to the, the semen processing equipment. Like we use the industry best because we want to know everything uh-huh. there is to know about that semen sample so that we can tell you, hey, today's shipment wasn't very good or today's shipment was really good or how can we do this better the next time? You know, and, and you know, it, it's just one example. So um, I, I would say what sets us apart is our core principles of, of how we operate. Well, I am blown away by that <laughs> example of all of that. And I think what's really neat about what you just hit on, too, is just all of the different pieces that go into it. Like, yes, your excellence and your attention to detail and all of that for sure sets you all apart. But I think for those listening, especially younger people, just the amount of jobs that you just listed and roles that go into (laughs) this, you know, I think people think I can be a horse trainer or I could be a vet and maybe a chiropractor. But I think, I mean, just to hear all of those different examples of potential jobs and career paths and what we need in this industry, that is a piece that was very unexpected to me at the beginning of this podcast. And I really hope young people listening, you know, take out a pen and paper or text a friend like, Hey, did you know that this job even exists? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's true. It, it, it takes a whole team. And, and the way we always refer to each other is we're a ranch family, you know, mm-hmm. uh, we're not, it's not just a job for us. Cause we, we, you know, we live on the ranch. We eat all, we all eat together. We have Miss Susie. She cooked breakfast and lunch for us. So we all, <laughs> live together essentially on the ranch we all eat together and we all work together we are we are a ranch family and and that's what it takes like when you're in the in the horse industry like really truly you, you got to be a part of it absolutely and dr Canada, you gave some incredible advice to people at any uh fast of their life and that dream big don't quit be great and i'm sure you've received some great advice from mentors along the way what is some of the best advice you received? Oh man, uh, that's a good one because just like it, like I mentioned, it takes a great team to run Absolutely. an operation as big as the six is. You know, it takes to be successful. You have to have lots of good help and mentorship along the way. And and I know I definitely couldn't be where I was at if it wasn't for multiple key people in my career path and in and, and my education and all of that. But kind of two things really stood out to me when you asked that question it kind of popped in my mind was one uh dr blodgett he managed the horse division for 40 years um prior to when he passed away at the end of 22 and uh, i i had, was blessed to work with him for 16 years um but uh uh one time when i was a it was, i was doing my first internship at the ranch in 2006 and you know i was just i, I was falling in love with the ranch and kind of solidifying my dreams of yes I want to be a vet and all that kind of stuff and and I was on shutdown duty one night and the horse was colicking and I had to call him for help and and so he came down and he was working the case up and I was holding the horse and 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 I, I just vividly remember this like it was yesterday but I, I you know he of course Dr. Plot was real quiet and didn't say much and so I it, you know finally I couldn't stand it anymore and I just kind of wanted to know what he was thinking so I said 
well, what do you think, Doc? Do you think he has a twisted gut? And he looked at me and he goes, you have a lot of potential, and I do believe you're going to go on to be a successful vet, but you do have to speak a little bit more intelligent because you sound ignorant when you speak like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> using, using the term twisted gut. Because, you know, from a vet perspective, you have a colon torsion, you have a small intestine strangulation. You know, you have all these very specific descriptors, <laughs> you know, that fall under, quote, unquote, twisted gut. You know, and, and he just like, so that his point was speak intelligently. You know, you don't, you don't want to sound ignorant, you know? Um, and, and so that kind of always stuck with me. And, and then another time when I was in vet school, I was helping at a breeding farm in Colorado and Dr. Ryan Coy uh, was letting me give an IV shot. And I just got the needle in, got a good flash of blood. And then all of a sudden there was chaos in the stalks next to us. I don't even remember if the horse was jumping out or something. And like, of course, I like turn my head and I just start watching that, the, the wreck unfold beside us and and i remember him getting after me pretty sternly about when you're a vet when you're a leader when you're in charge whatever you know wherever you're at in life like if you're doing something so in this case an iv shot you need to focus on that and don't get distracted by the chaos around you and and i just remember that day so vividly but then there have been so many times where there's different situations and like as, oftentimes as a vet or a leader you know it seems like everything's crashing around you, but you still have to stay focused on what you were supposed to be doing because it may be something very crucial, like giving an IV shot, you know, cause you can mess that up and then make the bad situation even worse, you know? And, and so, you know, to me, that was just such a, some good advice of like, you have to stay focused, even if everything else around you seems like it's going to pot, like stay focused and do a good job of what you were doing, doing. So that, that, that was another important lesson. I felt like that that mentor gave me as well. Those are both fabulous lessons, and I'm so glad you brought up Dr. Blodgett. Um, he and I knew each other through American Horse Council. He would always come to D.C. Oh, yeah, every yeah. June, and we go up to Capitol Hill and talk about horse issues to our congressmen and those types of things. And he was always, um, quite frankly, a mentor of mine. I would always pick his brain and ask him things, and what a what a neat guy. So I'm so glad that, that you brought mm -hmm. him up today. Wonderful. So those of us in the Western industry have known about the four sixes, you know, for a long time, but we did notice an uptick in popularity with those outside of the industry because of the Yellowstone franchise. Can you talk to us a little bit more about this momentum and how it is? Have you ever been um, involved in one of the TV shows? Have you ever been there when they've been filming? What has all that been like for you? Sure. So, uh, you know, they're definitely, I, I do think, you know, Taylor has, has brought um, some some great popularity, some great light to our way of life in the horse business um, with ranching and that sort of thing. Um, obviously, very intimately so when he bought the ranch. Um, but uh, I mean, so so yes, I mean that that question had a had a lot packed in there. But so yes, I have been around some whenever they've done some of the filming, you know. And and to me, it's so neat because I've never been around any of that. But it's so neat to see the professionalism and the detail that they pour into every one of the episodes. You know, I, I was able to see them film some for um, Yellowstone and for 1883. And, cool. you know, they, they, whenever they build a set, like, like they built Doan's Crossing out on one of our pastures in the ranch um, in 1883. And uh, I mean, they legit built a general store out there. They didn't have some fake prop, like the amount of awesome. detail that they put into it was like, to me, like what you expect out of a movie, not, a TV episode and, and the crew, you know, I, I was just, I don't know. I think a lot of people have preconceived notions and I maybe was guilty of that too, but the, all the, the, the staff that came in and, you know, I mean, they had guys come in that their, their job was to um, use some sort of acid to make the wood look like it was a hundred years old. I mean, but they like, they're like professionals at that and they're very good and they do a good job at it. Um, and, and so, I mean, it is, it's, I mean, it's neat to watch that in, in the amount of detail and, um, you know, but the other, you know, aspects of the question that you had asked, you know, is, is the Yellowstone effect. And that is definitely a thing. I think everybody's experienced it, whether you're in raining, whether you're in ranching, you know, uh, the Western way of life has brought so much popularity to it. Um, and, and you know, sometimes it, you know, it, it's not necessarily realistic, you know, but it is good television. Um, but it has made people very interested in horses in the Western way of life, which I do think 
is obviously huge and, and, and amazing. Um, one time Taylor told me that uh, he'd asked somebody, you know, what's the most popular ranch in America? And they said, oh, well, Yellowstone Ranch. And, of course, he was devastated because he's like, no, that's not even a real ranch. It's a 460 ranch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he, I know I know that's his goal is, is you know, and, and it's so neat watching it, you know, over the last couple of years and getting to know him and, and how much he's poured into the ranch um, in, in wanting to make it successful and, and help us grow and take everything to the next level. And, and part of that is, you know, we're very committed to the horse industry. You know, we're very involved with making the world the best ranch horses, but also we're involved um, with the Cutting Horse Association, the Rain Cow Horse Association, the Raining Association with y'all. And, 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 you know, the performance horse sector, like we're very passionate and want to be involved with that. Um, you know, we, we, uh, Cade McCutcheon been riding finals bound for us. And, you know, we have quite a few other stallions and um, horses that we're showing in the NRHA, uh, you know, stopping in Jersey was at the Derby this year and stuff. So, so we're very involved personally with our ownership of it and, and going to be in the breeding going forward as well. Um, but to me, it's, you know, I like to take a step back and like see the big picture too of, of yes, we're involved with each of these big associations, right? You know, raining, rain cow horse, uh, cutting horses and all that. But like, to me, it, it positions us in such a unique position because like, I'm a big believer too um, in hybrid vigor in terms of breeding, you know, because cause so many times each discipline gets so focused on almost inbreeding and, and then you get into a big old genetic bottleneck. Um, but, but so like for just one example, this year, I bred a whole bunch of my ranch mares, which are cow bred mares, to a bunch of our reigning stallions. Um, I, I've actually done that in the last two years. And the babies that have come out of them are so cool looking. Um, and I'm so excited about what they're, how they're going to make, you know, both in reigning and ranching and rain cow horse, really, truly. Um, so, so it's kind of, to me, a fun, you know, we're, we, like, just like I said earlier, like we have all this rich history and legacy behind us, but yet, we're changing and evolving and growing and, and trying new things. And, and, and so to me, that's kind of, uh, kind of, we're poised for a, a fun future, I guess you could say. Um, I think I'm not sure I'm if I covered so all the things on your question. Cause you asked a bunch there, but uh, <laughs> so, so yes, the Yellowstone effect is real. And, uh, and, and, but that has allowed us to do a lot of fun things like pairing with the NRHA. Well, fun almost seems like an understatement because it's just really exciting to watch. And I know we feel excited to be part of it. At the beginning of the podcast today, Christy and I actually talked about the Run for a Million coming up and just what Taylor has done. And, you know, it's really Mm -hmm. fun to be at that event and be with so many people that are truly there because of learning about the four sixes and because of the show. And that that Run for a Million is such a neat event to me because, you know, you bring in the best reigning horses, right? And, and, mm-hmm. and then you bring in the best cow horses and the best cutting horses. And then, you know, and then you also started the, the cowboy class too, you know, so you, you get all these different people that normally, you know, like I know a lot of cutters, for example, you'd never catch them at a raining event, but mm-hmm. yet you have all those trainers and all those fans and all those people from all those disciplines all together in one facility. And, and really what it is doing is just, it's uniting the horse industry. And, and we so need that, you know, because, I mean, uh, we just need to be unified together because we all have the same love of a horse. Um, and, and so I think he's created something very special there as well. Absolutely. And we all talk a lot about how, you know, when we rise by lifting others, well, you know, us helping each other, regardless of what industry, it's good for all of us. It's good for building fans. And um, we know fans are going to want to know more about four sixes when they listen to this podcast today. Uh, what's the best way for them to reach out to you guys and learn more about the four sixes and really get connected? Sure. So we have uh, uh, the four sixes website, www.6666range.com. You know, on that website, there's a history section and it has a whole bunch of information about the Burnett family and, and all the past 150 year history associated with the ranch. You know, on there that we have links to our supply house where there's merchandise. We have links to, you know, we have a lot of cool partners that we're doing things with, uh, you know, we have where you can do direct to c- consumer beef and you can go buy four sixes steaks or beef um, and get it shipped straight to your home. Uh, we have the stallion page and on, on the stallion page, you can click on every one of the stallions that pulls up everything about the stallion, you know, 
Um, and, and during breeding season right now, like if you did it right now, it wouldn't be active. But we have where our contracts are online, and you can just click on it, fill it out. It's so user-friendly. You can even do it on your phone. Um, but you, you can you can order semen. You can look up uh, pictures and videos of each of the stallions and their genetic information. And So our website is a wealth of information. Uh, we also have a fantastic marketing team that keeps our social media uh, Facebook, Instagram, all of that act up to date. And, you know, we're with as big as the four sixes it is in the number of, of horses that we have that are showing the number of babies that are out there from our stallions and our broodmare and that sort of thing. You know, it, it, there's, there's constantly, you know, new stuff coming, put out new news, new updates and all that kind of thing. So social media is also a good platform to stay up to date with us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Candidate. You covered everything. I had a bunch of things in here. Oh, I hope we talk about this, this, and this, and I'm checking it all off as we go. So we just so appreciate okay. you being such a, a longtime corporate partner of the National Reigning Horse Association, and we so appreciate this information more about the four sixes and everything that you do there. So we really appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you. Yes, of course, and it's, it's our honor to partner with y'all. Oh my gosh, Christy, I am leaving that interview feeling so inspired. I literally have dream big, don't quit, be great on a sticky note on my monitor of my computer. <laughs> yes. He was like a motivational keynoter. <laughs> yeah. So good. We, we knew he's brilliant. We knew how incredible the four sixes uh, historically has been, where it's going, how incredible that is. I mean, we knew all of this, but the motivational speaking part, I just did not expect. And I am so inspired. <laughs> it was excellent. And now I'm so excited to have um, our next guest on John Tag. And we'll talk a little bit more about him in a moment, because it's a very different jump, um, not only because Toyon focuses a little bit more on mares, they also have stallions too, but also just, uh, boy, his background, you'll find out here in just a second about him as well. John Tagg has been in aviation for most of his career. He was the president of United Airlines and also the CEO of Hertz. Now he is the owner of Toyon Ranch in Pilot Point, Texas. Hi, John. Welcome to the show today. Thanks. Great to be with you guys. So I'm just going to jump right in because, wow, your career has been uh, fascinating. And I want to know what airplanes and horses have in common. Oh, my gosh. This is like Jeopardy. Um <laughs> <laughs> They're both transportation, um, yes. and, and one paid for the other. <laughs> I think that is fabulous. So tell us more about Toyon Ranch from the aspect of why Pilot Point, why, how did that name come to be, all of those things. Oh, uh, Nancy and I came to uh, Texas for me to uh, do a brief run running a private equity portfolio company um, on an interim basis, and Nancy decided she wanted to stay. Um, we've been, we've known each other for over 50 years and we met through horses, um, and, uh, appendix quarter horses. I actually used to show in the general hunter jumper circuit and always had a fondness, uh, for them. Um, so we, uh, decided to pursue a lifelong dream of, uh, having a breeding program. So why the name toy on, how did that come to be? Uh, that, that, that I can, I can blame Nancy for that because I, because I've been asked a hundred times since, but um, Toyon is both a native plant of California, but more importantly, um, it was the name of a farm that was down the street from the home that Nancy lived in that she used to go down there and sit on the fence and watch the horses. That's so sweet. I love that. Well, John, our uh, episode today focuses a lot on breeding and what to look for and Obviously, the quality of our reigning horses we've just seen grow so, so much with every show. I feel like that's one of the main key talking points after. So what are some tips and tricks you have on what to look for in a quality breeder of reigning horses or really across all disciplines for that matter? Well, you know, I think it's, um, you know, the best you can hope for in a relationship with a breeding program and from my perspective with a customer is to have a relationship that feels like a long-term relationship as opposed to a transaction. Um, so there are, you know, very few people, and it's a small world who who operate in the rainy horse world, um, and particularly those that are seeking the um, best possible prospects. Um, there just aren't that many of them. And, and so it's important that um, you deal with someone that you feel from a reputation perspective will treat you um, the way they want to treat you on the 10th transaction, not just the first. Um, and we'll be candid with you and honest about 
what they have in their program that fits um, for your objective and, and what wouldn't fit? I love long-term relationship versus a transaction. You know, I mean, obviously with what I do for NRHA, with our sponsors and partners, I always talk to all of them about, we want to market your product or service. We don't just want to say, hey, thanks so much for that cash and I'll see you later. So I love that you think about that in the same perspective. And I know there at Toyon, you guys are known for your mayor power. So go ahead and tell us a little bit more about some of your favorite mayors, your most influential ones, and why. Why does What drives your passion to have a mayor-based program? You know, I've never been one that tries to allocate what percentage the mayor is versus the stud. You know, I presume they're both both equal in many respects. Um, but, you know, via a stud fee, you can rent the stud. Um, it's extremely hard to get access to some of the greatest mayors within the industry. So being mayor base um, in terms of the beginnings of our program provided us with real differentiation um, versus many other breeders. Um, and we really felt like that was the asset that, that we really wanted. We, we can keep them for a long time, have a relationship with them. We've got some great stallions here, um, but, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make a successful stallion. Um, and, and thankfully, a lot of our owners have committed to doing that and have been successful. But um, we, we we actually sold Patriot about a month before the Tulsa Futuri when he was a three-year-old. We felt very, very strongly that he was going to be a stud, but that was the moment in time that we decided to really build our program strength and differentiation on the mayor. Well, and John, you talked about kind of moving the, to the stallion route and bringing some of those stallions into your program. How did you pick which ones to stand there now today to help grow that program? Well, generally, first they have to pick us and then we decide who we're going to pick. So um, we've been very uh, uh, fortunate to have a number of great stallion owners select uh, toy on to stand their stallions. Uh, certainly one of the differentiations, you know, we provide as good a care and and uh, marketing uh, as anyone. I think one of the differentiations of our program in terms of a stallion station is the stallions we bring here, we are committed to breeding some of our best mares too. Um, and that's really where you're eating your own cooking, so to speak. Um, it's very difficult for junior stallions to get access to the mare quality that we have here. Um, so we can play a big role in making um, a stallion. The other thing I would say that's uh, pretty much common throughout the stallions we're fortunate to stand is they all come from great bottom sides. Um, and we really, really believe in the strong mare line underneath the sire uh, in terms of a breeding stallion in particular. I mean, obviously, we want to see performance. We want to see confirmation. We want to see attitude. Um, but it's an enormous foundational head start to have great bloodlines on top and on the bottom. And I think that's what differentiates many of our stallions. That makes complete sense. And we are so proud to have you um, there. Toyon Ranch is a corporate partner of the National Reigning Horse Association. And for years now, you have done so much with our rookie program and getting our folks that are just started into reigning to become a part for us and to be part of the whole program and hopefully one day have their own Horse that they want to breed and continue that lineage for themselves. So tell us a little bit more about why you and Nancy chose to do the rookie program and why it's so important to you. Well, you know, this is probably the third or fourth discipline we've entered on a serious basis. I hope the last one because it's it's uh, certainly the one we've been most committed to. But one of the things that we found so uh, unique about the reigning community when we started up I guess in 2012, probably uh, with Nathan Piper and Nathan did a fabulous job for us for a number of years on our futurity horses is the community was just very welcoming. And that is distinctive, maybe because we're a bit smaller than some other folks, but I think it's a distinct part of the reigning culture is to be welcoming to new participants. And we felt, well, what better way than to ease the path into competition um, by providing the complimentary uh, entry fee through the uh, rookie program? Um, and obviously, it's not you know a staggering amount of money for each of those individual folks, but I think sends them the strong message that there are people in this community that want to welcome you to their community. I think that's so true. And we've talked about that a lot on this podcast in different ways. But the thing I always circle back to is it is such a strong community. But also where on earth could someone truly, it's, you know, the same as someone walking up to an NFL player and asking to take a lesson or walking up to an NFL player before they're about to go into the Super Bowl and say, hey, would you mind helping me for a minute? 
And we do have access to those professionals and they are willing to do that and bring others into the community. So I think it's neat to hear from all different angles how willing everyone is to bring new people in. And this was really a beautiful way to do it. It's been so fun to watch the program grow throughout the years, thanks to your contributions. Well, it's been fun for us too. And obviously it's a positive impact on a lot of folks. And and we find for ourselves, as well as folks, many of the folks that are involved in rain, you know, a significant reason they're here is the camaraderie. It's not just the love of horses, which is foundational, but they really find a camaraderie within the rain community that is unique Um, especially for folks, frankly, that have been involved in other types of disciplines. Absolutely true. I, it really is so special. And I love that you touched on that today. And John, we know people are going to want to learn more about Toy on Ranch. And so what is the best way for them to reach out to you or maybe come visit and see how beautiful it is for themselves? Well, our uh, website is toyonranchllc.com. We're based in uh, Pilot Point. Um, we have a Facebook page. Our sort of ranch page is Toy on Ranch LLC. Um, and we're always open to the public, both the Stallion Station as well as uh, the, the Prospect Program. And we're delighted to have anybody come visit. As I tell folks, you don't have to buy a horse. Um, just come, come and visit. And you know, over time, you'll you'll learn more and, and we'll learn more about what you might want in the future. But, but um, we're delighted to have visitors, whether they're in a market for a horse or not. Thank you so much, John, for being on our podcast today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, you guys, very much. Christy, if we had a dollar for every person that came on the podcast and talked about how welcoming the reigning community was, just completely unprovoked, regardless of the subject, I really think we could maybe go on like a vacation. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking the same thing. And you know what? It's true. Um, I felt that same way coming in as even staff. Um, I just feel that the love of the horse, as John mentioned, is what gets us all started in it. But then there's something about the community of folks that hang out in the raining pen. They really are down to earth. And I I loved your analogy of being able to go up to some top, you know, NFL players or whoever and go, hey, can I come over and learn how to, you know, do stuff with you? <laughs> and that's what happens, right, at our shows. And it's just fantastic. It really is. It's uh, truly just a testament to the community, I think. And uh, John's right. It starts with the love of the horse, but there is just something special that keeps people in and really hooked once they just come and see it for themselves. Well, and thank you to everyone today for listening to this breeding episode. We will definitely have more um, reigning breeders on in the future to kind of share things and um, how what's important to them. I love today that we focused quite a bit on the mare with Toy On, but then also we had a lot of um, love for the stallion too, right? At four sixes, because it takes both to make a good foal. So I thought that was really good. And so for anybody that uh, wants to tune into any of our past episodes, they are all available. We have been doing these now for over a year. And you can go to nrha.com slash podcast. You can also find it on our Facebook page. Um, and we would just love to have you listen to some past episodes. And if you ever have any questions or want to reach out to Sarah and I, you can just go to the contact page of the NRHA website and find both of us. And we are happy to reach out to you in any way via phone, email, whatever you would like. Absolutely. We look forward to hearing from you, but now go out and have the slide of your life.